Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Steve. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Good, good. Well, it's really great to be back at Archives in History. It's always a treat to be here. I grew up uh, not too far from here. I, it was in Talladega, Alabama. Who's, who is familiar with where Talladega is? Well, okay, it's right there in the middle of what was the Cotton Belt in the 1850s, shown on this map. And, you know... <laughs> As a singer, I knew that there was a time when a soprano needs to get off the stage, and I decided I needed some other creative pursuit. So I had always been interested in quilts, and I decided that I'd join this group called the American Quilt Study Group. Sounds like fun. And then I found out that every other year they have this great quilt study where you can study an old quilt, learn something from it, and without, you know, two weeks passing, I found out that the first quilt study was going to be about quilts from the Civil War era, 1850 to 1865. I thought, that's really interesting. I'm not going to do this. But wouldn't it be interesting because... What a better place to find quilts from that era than in Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy. I mean, my gosh, we've got the star where Jefferson Davis stood. We have the little White House of the Confederacy. And most important of all, we have the Department of Archives and History. Well, I happen to know through Sunshine Huff, who lives here, that there was a quilt right here at Archives in History that was made in Talladega County. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I, I contacted Bob Tayson down here and found out that what they have is the acquisition letter that says, you know, here's a quilt that was made in 1851, and it was made at the Mount Ida Plantation in Talladega County, and it gave the names of the people who made the quilt. It was 12 women who lived on plantations, and some of them actually gave their plantation names. You can see that most of them are Welches and Mallories, and she even says that these Welches and Mallories were somehow related to her great-grandmother, Mrs. Reynolds. But that was basically all that Miss Mary Reed Crook knew about this quilt that she donated here to Archives in History in 1958. Well, the, the problem for me was, if that was all they knew about this quilt, I sort of felt obligated because I grew up right down the road from the Mount Ida plantation. And I thought, you know, I clearly had too much time on my hands, so I'll help Archives in History flesh out the information. I'm not going to do this silly quilt study thing, but I am going to help archives in history find out about a quilt that was made at this spectacular antebellum mansion, as they're called, in Talladega County. And here it is in all its glory. I mean, it is stunning. Those of you who are quilters can appreciate the beauty of this great quilt. Now, as I said, Bob Kaysen had done a lot of work to try to find out more about the provenance of this quilt. But between 1958, when it arrived here, and 2013, guess what made all of this research easier? The Internet. <laughs> yeah, and digital archives that were, that were now available. And so I thought, you know what, I can research this in my pajamas drinking my coffee. So that's what I decided to do because all, here are the online resources that we have now. I mean, look at all of the things that we can actually access right from our, with our fingertips from home. And then I do have to admit that having somebody on the ground is imperative. So I would be the on the ground person. I could go to the Talladega Library and find resources for local history that were available, including one that's absolutely the Bible of Talladega County history, and that is James Mallory's journal. Oh, okay. Well, let's start with our research. I thought this is going to be so easy. We already know that Hannah Reynolds was the daughter of Oliver Welch. The acquisition letter said that. So let's start with... 
Hannah Reynolds Welch. Why in the world did they move from Virginia, that's what it said, to Alabama? Well, Alabama history, we all passed Alabama history in the fourth grade, didn't we? Most of us, most of us passed Alabama history. And we know that that part, surrounded by the red dots, was not actually part of Alabama when it became a state in 1819. It was not until 1834 with the Treaty of Cassetta that that part of Alabama, including Talladega County, became a part of the state of Alabama, and it was like the latest subdivision opening, opening up. You know, this was land, fertile land, that was available. And so, the people from Virginia came down here and they claimed their land, they purchased it, but with that, they got a land patent. Okay, well, the first land patents, when you get land from the government, you get a land patent, and those records are online now at the Bureau of Land Management. Easy. I typed in Oliver Welch, and <laughs> look, bingo, first search. There it is right there. Oliver Welch, and in 1837, he got some land in Talladega. So, you know, I, I, I really thought this is going to be so easy. Right over here, you can click on that, and you get the actual image of the land patent. So there it is. Oliver Welch, assignee of James Mallory, which means that James Mallory purchased it on behalf of Oliver Welch. Well, okay, so we've got Hannah Reynolds sort of checked off the list, Oliver Welch's daughter. We know the name Mallory, but there are three Mallory women on the quilt. Now, let me just have an aside right now. Do not try to keep these women straight. They're all named Welch, Mallory, Mary Ann, and Mary Jane. So do not try to do a genealogy or you won't pay attention to anything else. But let's see which of these Mallorys might be related to James Mallory. We go back to his journal, and he says, myself, wife, and daughter Virginia, well, okay, but what's your wife's name? That's what we're looking for. You go to the, uh, oh, he says right there that Oliver Welch was a relative. So we're getting clues here. Oliver Welch and James Mallory are somehow related. And here is Oliver Welch. And we go back to why did he come from Virginia to Alabama? What we all want. He wanted better things for his children. So let's go to the 1840 census records. You look for James Mallory, but in the 1840 census, no first names are given of people in the household. Only the man in charge of the household is listed. So let's fast forward to 1850 to the census records, and there we have it. James Mallory's wife on the 1850 census is Anne, and that was the second name on the quilt. So if we do that for the rest of the members of, pe of the people who made this quilt, we will see, yeah, there's Anne, and there's Johanna Mallory. Oh, she's married to John. There's Ann Wallace and Mary Mallory. Oh, but look, Mallory is spelled M-A-L-E-R-Y. The census taker didn't know how to spell that name. So we go through each one of these. Sarah Welch. Oh, there's Oliver Welch. And we find out he's a Baptist minister. Um, Mary White and Mary Welch and Francis... Bert. Ah, Fanny is a nickname for Francis. So this must be Fanny Bert. And if you look right here, she has a Welch, a five-year-old girl, female, living in the household. So there's some Welch connection to this Fanny Bert. Well, We've got it all figured out here. We've got all the names on the quilt. We know who their husbands were, and we know a little bit more about them. But, okay, I could have turned it over to Archives in History, and, you know, we'd have been done with this, but 
Why? Why didn't they make this quilt? Why was it so beautifully preserved? We go back to James Mallory's journal and we find out in 1851 that his daughter Virginia married her cousin James. I try not to think about that. <laughs> there they are, the bride and groom. Let's not, let's not dwell on this. The bride and the groom, all related to each other, but you know, they're in a new part of Alabama and there weren't a lot of options there. So we've got the bride and the groom and now we know how the quilt makers, the 12 quilt makers, are related to the bride and the groom. They're all somehow related to either or both of, the, of those people. So I'm ready to wrap it up, send it off to Archives and History, and say, boy, this was fun. This was really great. Okay, but I keep thinking about that American Quilt Study Group. Quilt Study, I mean, think about this. What if, what if I could find the, the people who live on that property now and get them to adopt the original quilt maker and make that same quilt square for this quilt study. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Oh, God. I, thought, yeah, I know, yeah. Uh -huh. So I thought, no, we don't have to do this. It's just still a fun thought. So, for example, let's take Mary Mallory. Just pick that name. Let's find out where Mary Mallory lived. Well, you go back to the land records and you see that Mary Mallory is married to William and you get the section, the township, the range. We all know how to read maps. So let's do that for all 12 of these women. Number eight is Mary that we just looked up. And if you take the land records, you find out where each of these women lived. They're within eight square miles of each other. You know, that's not all that far on a good horse. And two of them live out here in Shelby County. That's the Coosa River. They live out there, and there's one that lives in town. Well, I'm still thinking about this. That still would be fun. I thought, well, here's the way to find out. Let's take Fanny Burt, for example. I've got to find somebody that would adopt Fanny Burt, so I make the easy call first. I, I call my sister-in-law. She actually lives in the house that Fanny Burt's sister stayed in during the Civil War. It's right down the road from where Fanny lived. And I said, hey, Gina, I've got this great idea. You want to do this? And she said, sure. I said, all right, that was easy. So then I thought, all right, we've got to include Mount Ida because it's called the Mount Ida quilt. And so I called Ann, who lives there on the property, and Hannah is in the cemetery right next to her house, and she said, well, okay, fine, I'll do it. Sounds interesting. So I called, and I called my friend Lucy, I mean my friend Carolyn, who lives at Selwood, and the front door of Selwood is on their house. And she said, oh, that sounds fascinating. So a three out of three, this is great. I keep going, Johanna Mallory, we don't know exactly where she lived, but I do know that Ann Stapleton had to be a part of this because her great-great-grandfather went to church with these quilt makers. Uh, Ann said she was in, so then I called my friend Lucy, whose uh, family cemetery has the, the remains of Ann Jenkins. She said, hey, if Ann Stapleton's in, I'm in. I mean, this is really too easy. Um, we really needed this person out in Shelby County, and so we, I called Nancy, who lives on the road out towards the house that uh, Mary Mallory lived in. Now, this one was easy. Sarah Welch, the Baptist preacher's wife, her sister... Uh, lived in Thornhill, and Sarah is buried in Thornhill. And Cindy said, yeah, sure, she had to adopt Sarah because she has to walk past her grave every day. But there's always one call that you dread to make. I really needed the, the one in town. My sister lives one block <laughs> from the house that uh, Mary Jane White lived in. So I called Debbie and I said, hey Debbie, I've got this great idea. And she said, you want me to do what? <laughs> I said, oh come on. She said, no. I said, it will be fun. 
She said, do you know how many times you have told me that in my life? And it's never fun. No, 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 <laughs> well, clearly, she said, okay, well, if everybody else is, I will. So it was smooth sailing from here. By this time, uh, Millie, uh, I made the call to Millie. All these people swam in the spring on her property, and she said, I've already heard about it, and I was hoping you'd call. And then there's Mary Jane Wilson, whose family built the house that is still standing, and our friend Lou's family owns it. She said she was in, and that leaves the little wonky square there. That one's not our prettiest square. I mean, you know, I got Dell, who's is the caretaker of the cemetery where Mary Jane is buried. I got her to say yes, and that leaves one square. Somebody that lives outside of Talladega County. Well, who else? I had to take a square. I mean, I couldn't ask everybody else to do one if I didn't take one. 12 out of 12. I mean, this was easy. So we called our inaugural meeting for Gina's house, the house that really still stands in the middle of all of this property. And we said, like good Southern ladies, well, first of all, we have to have a name. So we named ourselves the Mount Ida Society. And then we had to have a checklist. The first thing we were going to do is we were going to make a field trip and come down here and look at this quilt. And if we looked at this quilt and said, we can't do this, then the deal is off. We walked in to the Milo Howard room, and there it was in all of its glory. And we got cold feet, but Ryan and Bob were there with white gloves and allowed us to inspect and photograph, and we looked at the details on it. We looked at the, the embroidery, we looked at the applique, and really we said, you know, we all have some needle skills. None of us were quilters, but we did have needle skills, and we said, all right, it, this, this is for the quilters in the room so that you can see the thought process behind how are we actually going to do this? Take this enormous quilt, reproduce it in miniature. Nobody had bailed yet. And remember, I said this was going to be fun. <laughs> but the first thing we, they stumbled on was... Where are we going to buy the fabrics? What, what kind of fabrics were they? Well, you know, once we analyzed them, we realized that we could buy fabrics just like they did. We're reminded from James Mallory's journal that they got fabrics from Mobile because they sent their cotton in 1850 on the Central Plank Road that went all the way from from right in the middle of their farmland down to Wetumpka, and then on the river from Wetumpka to Mobile, and then the return trip was made up the river. Easy. The, we would just order our fabric from Mobile, and the fabrics were easy to find once you knew what you were looking for. So we <laughs> went to Home Depot and did us a color chart, and I headed off to the fabric store in Mobile, and found the fabrics that we needed. Now the second question was, how did they share these fabrics? Because they lived eight miles up, away from each other. Well, they all went to church together. They were all members of the same church, and they were there every Sabbath. So that's how they shared the fabrics. That was a simple question, a simple answer. So there we are. We got together to share our fabrics and to find out what was ahead of us because we had to learn how we were going to applique. We didn't even know that. But we decided we would do it like paper dolls. We got a template of each of the squares. We reduced it. We copied it. And then we cut it out like paper dolls. This was going to be so easy. <laughs> right. There was my sister Debbie laboring over her square. Well, we, we broke it down into small goals. Every time, every time we got together, we just said we'll have one goal. And it was just to get as far as you can with the applique. And if you have a breakdown, stop, because you're not supposed to stress over this. But one of the things that we wanted to do in this exercise was to find out if taking on a project 
by, with your neighbors, if you grew closer as a community, because, you know, we're so accustomed now to rolling up our windows of our cars and pulling into our drives and the garage door comes down, do we really know our neighbors? We know to wave at them, but do you go in their kitchens and sit down and have a cup of coffee? So that's what we did. And we wanted to learn about the original quilt makers. So we were at Gina's house. She had adopted Fanny Burt. So we learned a little bit more about Fanny Burt. She was married to the groom's brother, and little Martha that was on the census records was her daughter, and little Martha actually grew up to be a journalist. So we gained a little bit more knowledge about what life was like um, through her published records, and she said she could ride a horse, basically, from Orangevale to Thornhill to Mount Ida, so we could get a better perspective on how long it would take you to get from one house to another. She also said that her mother was a very fine uh, uh, house, housekeeper and sewed beautifully and, was, and liked to garden. That might have been why they selected a, a floral theme for their quilt. And it showed that they did have good needle skills. Okay, so we get together for our second session. Now remember, you can bail at any time if you're not having fun. But everybody shows up, and we're making a little progress. We're working on it. We're even using 21st century technology to analyze this quilt. And we set another goal, just Finish your applique. That's all you have to do. Don't think any farther than that. And while we're there, looking out the windows of Selwood at the very same hills that Ann Mallory looked at, we find out that she was actually building a new house while she was getting ready for the wedding. She and her husband were interested in raising the standard of education for women. We also found out that she didn't have many teeth, but her husband still loved her for it. Don't you wish we had pictures from the wedding <laughs> with her toothless smile? Okay, we set our, our, our third meeting, and we go over to Millie's house where the spring is, where they used to, to swim. Now, at this point, you know, we're asking for confession. Who has had a total breakdown and can't finish their square? But actually... Everybody's doing really well, and nobody's crying. Everybody is still speaking to each other, but it always helps. You know, there's one overachiever in every group, <laughs> and this was Nancy for us. This was not her first square. She had already made one square, wasn't happy with it, and had made a second one. So we knew we were in good hands when we have an overachiever with the group. And silly questions came up, like... How in the world? Here we all are with our 2.0 cheaters on. How did they thread the needle and do this very fine work? We don't have an answer to that. Our goal for the next one was to start your embroidery. We had a little more courage with embroidery because most of us were familiar with the embroidery. So we had, you know, we helped each other. We had books about embroidery, and we had books about applique, but there was one book we did not appreciate. <laughs> I don't know who gave us that book. We did not even open it. <laughs> now, while we're there, we talked about Mary Mallory, who lived right there in that vicinity. We found out that she and her husband were latecomers to the area, and they tragically, almost as soon as they arrived, lost their 16-year-old daughter, poor Betty, to a fever. Now, Mary's daughter, Anne, had a baby two weeks after this family wedding that we are talking about, and she named her baby Betty after her sister. It was a close-knit family. Now, we had to take a little break from our embroidery because we needed batting, right? If you would like to know how to stop traffic on Highway 21, you send a bunch of white middle-aged women out there to pick cotton on a Sunday afternoon, 
people were screeching to a halt because they didn't quite believe what they had seen. We indeed picked our own cotton for the batting from the fields that the original that cotton had been grown on back then and probably had been used for batting. And uh, there were some things we didn't think about, like what were we going to do with it after we picked it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you 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 call in favors then, and we called in our friends at the Bemis Museum in Tennessee, and they had connections to a small gin. So in Two weeks, UPS brought our cotton back to us, freshly ginned. Now, we got the cotton picked. It was time for, you know, a little bit more of a, um, a, a get-together on how are we doing. We met at Alpine, which was the home of Mary Jane, and we said, does anybody need help? And the only thing we had left to do was to sign our squares. We put the name of the original quilt maker and our own names on the squares of the replicated quilt. We were doing great. We were still 12 out of 12. I couldn't believe it. As we were there looking at Mary Jane's beautiful house, we find the grave of her infant daughter that lived a few months but doesn't even have a name when she's buried. An, an odd thing to me. But if you look at the front door, the side lights next to the front door, you can see W.P. Welch. So clearly they had a son, W.P., who grew up old enough to write his name in cursive writing on the side light at Alpine. We're getting so close. So we, we have a party. We schedule a Christmas party to bring your squares and turn them in. Here we all are. Now, that littlest one is not drinking champagne. The rest of us were in copious quantities. <laughs> and we're there a block away from Mary Jane White lived, and she was the youngest of the group. She lived in town. She was married to a lawyer. She was the daughter of the preacher's wife. Now, the preacher's wife didn't marry the preacher until 1848, and they had a big festive wedding and reception that took place at the home of the, the groom. But a few years later, there was a bigger celebration when she burst the bands of Methodism and joined the Baptist church. <laughs> I did not know that Methodism was a cult, but apparently it was because it was a big celebration. Now... Uh, at this same church, we're reminded that the slaves were members of the church also. And their being members of the church was equally important to having the white members of the church. But they, the numbers of slave members grew so large that it was decided that they really needed their own church. And so Anne Jenkins' father-in-law gave money to build a church and hire a preacher for the black members of the congregation. And guess who the, the African Baptist Church called as their preacher? Oliver Welch. That's who they chose to be their preacher. It was a, a close-knit group, and we're becoming closer-knit because we're getting a lot closer to finishing this thing, so we brought our, our ginned cotton in to, back to Gina's house to put the batting in, and we brought in the only person that we knew who had actually used raw cotton batting, and that was our friend Catherine Collins, who is a neighbor. She instructed us on precisely how we were to get it smooth and thin and beautiful, and it looked like a blizzard had hit in the dining room by the time we were through. We put that quilt top on, rolled it up, it was ready to go, and I haven't told you that there was actually a 13th member of our group, somebody who actually knew what she was doing. <laughs> we brought in our friend Beth, who agreed to tutor us all on proper quilting technique. So it was only fitting that we do the quilting part of it at Mount Ida. 
So we met at at uh, our friend Ann's home. The original Mount Ida had burned in the 1950s, but Ann has built a house on the <coughs> knoll next to where the original house stood. So there we were, each taking a turn, figuring out how it was that we would get a beautiful finished quilt out of this project that we had started. Even the left-handed people took a stitch. And we remembered Hannah Reynolds. Her husband was one of the wealthiest men in the state of Alabama, a very influential man in this state. And in James Mallory's journal, he makes an entry right before this family wedding. It says that Mr. Reynolds lost one of his sons. And I thought, Mr. Reynolds? Well, what about Mrs. Reynolds? Look at what Mrs. Reynolds and Mr. Reynolds lost. They lost three children within a very short time, two of them within a few days of each other. How do you bear, how do you bear that grief? You know, once we're getting to know these original quilt makers as people, and we're starting to appreciate them for the trials that they undertook. Now, Hannah Reynolds clearly had lots of children because here is her extended family on the steps of Mount Ida. And uh, this picture was made in 1884. So while we're there, we decided we would walk over there and pay a visit to Hannah Reynolds. It's a beautiful site, an old family cemetery. And we looked at the same hills that the original quilters had looked at as they finished the original Mount Ida quilt. What a wonderful project we had had. There it is. We finished it. Can you believe it? And we are all still talking to each other. We're still friends. I mean, so all we had to do was bring it down here, put it next to the original quilt, and we're, we're done, right? Uh, no, 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 we're not quite done because here we go again. We've got questions. It was given to the bride and the groom. Why did the groom's sister end up with the quilt? Okay, this will be quick. Let's find out what happened. Here's the bride and the groom. Just two weeks after the wedding, Ann Jenkins died. So, you know, she's... Sadly, they're down to 11. And Wallace died of typhoid fever. She's the mother of little Betty. Remember poor Betty? Well, Betty went to live with another of the quilters, and poor Betty had been badly burned in a fire. She stood too near the fire, and their clothes caught fire. But she went to live with another of the quilters, who was a relation. Johanna moved off to Louisiana. You know, it just... Times got hard and opportunities were greater in Texas and Louisiana. Mary Jane lost a child and then lost another child. And by 1860, she said, I am out of this town. I am going to somewhere big and exciting. So she went to Selma. <laughs> 1860. We know what's coming. James Mallory says in his journal how much he fears the sectional rancor and strife. And he himself wants to stay with the Union. He's not a secessionist. He, he by March, says he fears the things that are happening in Charleston and Mobile. And, of course, April 12th, the shots were fired. So what happens to these women during this time in our um, in our Alabama history. Well, Sarah, the preacher's wife, died of natural causes in 1861. Mary Jane at Alpine, that beautiful house, well, it seems that her husband had a problem, and the efforts to reclaim him from those spiritous liquors um, ha have not been successful. So she has her hands full. Mary Jane, uh, oh, this, the same Mary Jane lost a son, Oliver, in the Battle of Atlanta, and they hear that troops are on their way to Talladega County. Can you imagine what these women are thinking as 
most of the men are off fighting, and Rousseau is coming through, and he passes. He takes things from Thornhill, from Orangevale, and from Mount Ida. How, how fearful they must have been. Thankfully, by December of 1865, that war was over, and they all looked to the future. But the future is not all that exciting in Talladega County. Most of the sons and daughters went off to brighter futures somewhere else. Um, cousin Mary Mallory um, had died, and, and they said, you know, she just never quite recovered from her husband's death. James Mallory says by 1873, money is scarce. You can't get credit and you can't sell your property. So they are basically stuck there on fertile lands, but without the labor to do anything with them. The bride catches uh, the yellow disease, yellow fever, and she dies in 1876. Well, the distraught husband doesn't see any reason to stick around, so he moves to Florida. He didn't need a big old thick, heavy quilt in Florida. It's warm in Florida. And so it's just our opinion, but it's a pretty sound one, that he looked at the people remaining as he's packing up his goods to move to Florida, and all those people in red are already dead. The people in green have moved away. Those are his sisters-in-law. You don't give things to your sister-in-law. And then there's Mary Jane, who has the husband with the problem and taking care of poor little Betty. That leaves the mother of the bride and his sister. And we're pretty sure that he gave it to his sister back at Mount Ida, where it had come from. And there is Hannah Reynolds with her adult children. And so, how did we come to this story? Well, there's Hannah Reynolds right there. And she gave it to her daughter, Jane, who gave it to her son, who gave it to his daughter, Miss Mary Reed Crook, who fortunately gave it to the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Because this is what is left of Mount Ida now. A sad sight, but what a glorious thing that in 1958 she decided that this quilt should not be hidden in a trunk. And I say amen to that, because without it, we wouldn't have learned all of these things that's here at Archives in History from this wonderful quilt that tells so many stories. Thank you for listening to my story, and I appreciate it. Did I leave anything? Did any any um, big? Oh. Oh, I must have been good. <laughs> no <laughs> question. <laughs> one question. Right here. Sarah. Can you tell us uh, something about what's happened to the quilt you made? Good story. Yes, the quilt was turned in to the American Quilt Study Group. It was one of 25 selected to tour the nation, and it has been, a, it started up in New England. It is now in Arizona. In uh, March of 2018, it will be right here. And so you'll have a chance to see the little one and the big one together. <laughs> Yes, sir. I have a quilt that was my grandmother's wedding gift. Is there anyone you can talk to about preserving it or framing it? The best person that I know of to refer you to is seated right there at the back, and that is Mary Elizabeth Sunshine Huff, who can guide you on, uh, on the proper storage technique and preservation. Yeah. Right. Did you see her? Okay. Yes, sir. Do I have plans to make a little booklet? You know, I've thought about that because it'd make a great coloring book, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, to tell the story. I have thought about it. I just haven't gotten there yet. But 
I know, I know it goes so fast. So, sorry, but, you know, got, there's a lot to say. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for coming.